live. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for logging on and joining us. My name is Jonathan Butler. I'm the president and CEO of One Berkshire, and we're pleased to have you for another edition of our, of our weekly One Berkshire virtual town hall series. This week's topic focuses on reopening the Berkshire economy, something I think that's fresh on all of our minds and has been, has been fielding a lot of inquiries and questions and people seeking direction, so we're excited to get into some of that this morning. I'd like to remind all of our listeners that this, le this webinar is being recorded. It'll be replayed through some other media outlets throughout the course of the week. Our format today is we're gonna spend about 45 minutes with our excellent panel, having some dialogue and talking about some of the, the pieces of reopening our economy. And then we'll shift to a Q&A where our listeners can submit questions that we'll, we'll go through and we'll try to pick questions that we think would be great for this group to hear. The prompts on the bottom of your screen, you'll see both a chat icon and a, a Q&A icon. You can submit questions through either of those. If you can focus them in the Q&A icon, it's a little easier for us to keep track of. You can also make comments in the chat function. And with that all shared, I think we'll jump right into who our panel is this morning. We're very excited to have with us our state senator, Adam Hines. We also have Jennifer Trainer thompson from the president and CEO of Hancock Shaker Village. We have Ben Sosny, the executive director of the Berkter Innovation Center, and Williamstown town manager, Jason Hoke. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Great to be here. So uh, first thing we'd like to do is, um, why don't we just give you all a chance to say hello to the, to the listeners. Um, maybe you could just share a bit about, uh, you know, introduce, introduce your role in case anybody isn't familiar with each of you, and then maybe just talk for a minute or two about what your work and your organization has been focused on the last few weeks. And we can start with, uh, we will start with the Senator. Great, good morning and, and thank you, Jonathan. And thanks to, to One Berkshire for, for continuing to um, lead the way on, on all things economic uh, investment and development and, um, and welcome to everybody who's, who's joining. Maybe I'll start by just setting the context. I, we all woke up to some concerning news, economic data today. Um, from a national perspective, retail, retail sales um, in April dropped 16.4%. You'll remember um, in March, we hit the highest all-time reduction in retail sales when we got 8.9%. And this includes um, online sales, and the online sales went up. So it would have been even further um, if it didn't have that, uh, the, the addition of the, the online sales. Um, it's, it's, you know, in trying to set the context, uh, we, we now have nearly a million jobless claims in Massachusetts in the last eight weeks. There are seven million people in Massachusetts. And, and when you bring that into uh, Berkshire County, the Pioneer Institute just released a report that shows us at 27.8% in unemployment claims uh, and, and the unemployment rate. Um, it's just, uh, it, it speaks to the importance of what might happen next week in terms of reopening and trying to be focused like a laser on, on jobs and access to jobs and income. Um, the, the trajectory we're on when it comes to the economy, I'm going to just wrap this up here in a second here, but I, it's on my mind, so I want to share it. UBS just did a report that showed they expect 100,000 retail stores to close in the next five years. And again, compared to the Great Recession, there were 20,000 that were closed. So we're in the middle of a major shift in our economy, um, a redistribution of, of, of our economy in many ways. So I'm a, I'm a legislative observer on the governor's advisory board, uh, reopening advisory board. And so um, literally my two weeks for the last two weeks have been spent on uh, more than 70 uh, sessions with in different sectors throughout the economy. Um, I can give more details on that later, uh, but it's been, you know, what we've been trying to do is making sure we're engaging with Carlo, um, who's the CEO at General Dynamics, and he's a party, he's an official member of the board, making sure our regional input has been put on there. Um, we've been in regular calls with obviously the health system to make sure that what does that piece of the reopening process look like. And, and then finally, uh, because of my being the, the senator on the observing the reopening board, we've been trying to prepare what our legislative response will be. Um, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of areas where the guidances will have unintended consequences, and we want to be on top of that. Great. Well, thank you for all that, Senator, and, and thank you for all the work you've been doing. We've, we've we've seen you everywhere. We know you've been a real advocate for the region, and we look forward to hearing more this morning. We'll shift over to to Jennifer. Good morning. 
Good morning, and uh, thank you for having me. I'm director of Hancock Shaker Village, as you introduced me before, which is a site that was uh, settled in 1784 um, and sprawls across Pittsfield, Richmond, and Hancock. Um, Adam, those, those numbers are, are really sobering. Um, the last few weeks, we've been focused uh internally and externally i'd say internally we've we've formed an opening advisory team that is looking at safety from from all different angles our staff our visitors our animals um we made a decision to plant our gardens even though we don't know uh when we will open we have over five acres and uh an interesting observation to me was the fact that we we have in addition to being a beautiful part of the landscape we provide food to people and we have a community supported agriculture program that uh, we've expanded by 10 percent this year and it's already sold out and in addition we give away about 15 percent of our produce to um, local food banks so that's an important part that we've kept going even while we're closed and we're focused on our animals. You may have seen our goats uh, zooming with me uh, and other people. We're, we're focused programmatically on, on new creative ways for people to experience Hancock Shaker Village. I'm, I'm really, um, I'm inspired by places like the Clark and, and, and the Mount. Susan Whistler told me that, you know, last weekend she had about 500 hikers in the Mount. I'd only gone there to the, to the, uh, to the building and to performances by Shakespeare and Company. But I hiked there last weekend and there's 50 acres of trails. Um, so we're starting to focus on our property as an outdoor property as well. Um, I would say that in the last few weeks, I've also been trying to look for silver linings. I think we all need the silver linings and, and what we can learn from this, this horrendous experience really. And I must say that it, it's the collaborative spirit of the culturals in Berkshire County has been really encouraging. Um, you know, we're all busy usually in, in this season and it's a long drive from Williamstown to Beckett. But the, the beauty of Zoom is that uh, we're, we're all talking about ways that we can reignite our segment of the economy safely and slowly. There was a meeting yesterday of CFOs of culturals talking about procedures. Uh, I have a weekly meeting with uh, the, the directors of historic sites and gardens. And I must say that we're looking for the opportunities um, that this, this, this new reality can, that we can find our way through. That's the last few weeks. Thank, thank you for that, Jennifer. And I'm interested to get a little bit more into the cultural perspective on that a little later in the discussion. I do want to apologize to our listeners if you're experiencing any issues with any of our audio and visual. I think it's, it's actually all of us, so it's probably a bandwidth issue in the region. We've experienced a little bit of this on the Zoom calls. So audio seems pretty good. Um, visual is a little choppy, but hang with us. Uh, we'll switch over to, to Jason. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I'm glad to see so many people uh, participating. Sitting where I sit as a town manager in Williamstown, uh, a lot of what we focus on is spending a lot of time at the intersection of thinking about the economy and of health, uh, given sort of our uh, multiple responsibilities uh, in that area. Um, you know, after the earliest, the, the earlier stages of this, we figured out how to pivot our own operations, figure out how to operate with the traditional things that as governments, we all continue to do, um, you know, uh, meetings, um, collecting taxes, um, maintaining, uh, maintaining core services. Uh, and as we've moved on, it's be, and things have slowed, it's uh, become an exercise in thinking about what do our own operations look like uh, and what kind of revenue impacts and economic impact are we going to be absorbing um, from um, losses in, uh, in revenues um, from lodging, from meals, from cannabis taxes, realizing that uh, building projects are slowing. Uh, and of course, um, 
you know, in many communities in the Berkshires, the, um, the indirect from uh, so many of the um, cultural institutions and visitors uh, turn up in our world um, in um, hotel, hotel meal taxes from all of those visitors. In Williamstown's case, um, you know, our, uh, summer, um, our summer hotel taxes are what we uh, bring in the rest of the year. So, uh, you know, the precipitous loss of those, uh, which is about a quarter of our non-property tax revenue is something we have to, uh, you know, we're eager to figure out how to restart some of that. But at the same point, uh, you know, we also are the local health body that deals every day with the implications of um, the guidance we're seeing in terms of uh, growth of cases, containment of cases, uh, exposures, thinking about exposures that are yet to come, trying to um, dig a little deeper in terms of uh, the science behind something that, quite honestly, none of us thought about months ago, uh, and figuring out how do we best protect those people that are here now and those people that want them back. Um, you know, I think, uh, and then the last piece is that um, we are um, continue to look for ways to be able to support the next phases as they come up and figuring out what does that mean? What, what do we bring to the table? How do we, how do we support that? As simple as, okay, uh, are there ways that we can close, close the street downtown in, uh, at dinner hour because uh, limited restaurant seating inside a restaurant and is gonna be really tough with uh, you know, making things even have a chance of being successful. Uh, and then um, thinking sort of more distantly about what are those pieces where um, you know, we can support greater complexity. Uh, you know, uh, Williams College has a lot of projects uh, and construction projects, uh, major projects underway, and in the off season they do a lot of catch ups. How do we support that to help them move quickly in a safe and responsible way? So. Uh, on municipal end, it's in a very interesting wave of, and of quite honestly, sometimes dueling motivations. It's interesting. That's an interesting contrast too. Of you know, you really do. It's, it's it's easy to overlook how the municipal leadership has to balance both public health with the demand of businesses. You know, both of which are critical constituencies. Mm -hmm. um, we'll shift over to to Ben Sosny, who I think has the most creative backdrop, as he's looks like he's sitting in the middle of East Street, right in front of the Berkshire Innovation Center. Thanks, Jonathan, um, and thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of traffic out here today, so I should be safe. Um, <laughs> but uh, thanks for everyone who joined as well. Um, as, as, as you may know, I'm Ben Sazi, the director of the Berkshire Innovation Center, as Jonathan said. Uh, we had our grand opening uh, February 28th. We had close to 400 people packed in the Innovation Center. Um, mm -hmm. When you look through those pictures, uh, it's almost startling just to see everybody. We're so used to now, we've shifted so quickly, but to see that group gathered and everybody uh, shaking hands and hugging and, and shoulder to shoulder, um, it's a jarring contrast to, to, to obviously what we're doing now. Um, so that was obviously a quick turnaround for us. We were kind of head down in a, in a, in a two month sprint, so to speak, to, to pull off our grand opening. And, and, um, and, and then obviously as with everyone else, um, uh, you know, we had to shut our building. Um, what we did initially, it was really because we're working with, with the Manufacturing and Technology Center, we were connected with the Massachusetts Manufacturing Emergency Response Team, um, which was helping, which was an unbelievably impressive uh, uh, effort at the, at the state level. Um, I've, been, I've been just blown away by what, what that group has been able to do. Um, in terms of helping um, existing companies pivot towards um, producing uh, PPE for the short term and also looking medium and long term, knowing this problem is not going anywhere and recognizing the current supply chains um, in terms of getting most of that material from China uh, it, it is, not, uh, is not something we want to be so dependent on going forward. 
Um, so we were thrown right into that and trying to work with our manufacturers, really reaching out to everybody we work with and saying, hey, are you in this space? If you're not in this space, do you want to get in this space? Or do you happen to have uh, materials or expertise that could just have help in the short term? Um, for me and my staff, I think that was a, it's been a really, um, it was a great, it really accelerated our learning curve um, in terms of working with companies. Um, part of what we do is, is really prototyping, rapidly prototyping, rapidly iterating to move a product forward quicker. Um, it, you know, the demand was to move things very quickly, um, which was, which was really fantastic experience for us uh, under a, you know, sort of a, a, obviously a, a really challenging time. Um, I think there's been a shift over the last, you know, couple weeks to, uh, from, you know, that immediate panic to helping people, helping people, you know, get that personal protective equipment and we're still working on those projects, but now looking with, with the companies and, and, the, and, the, and the regional uh, partners and saying, okay, you know, this is obviously this is something that's going to stay with us for quite a while. Um, and how are we going to look to best utilize uh, the BIC, the resources that are there um, to, uh, you know, to help this sector of the economy. Um, the numbers, again, that, that Senator Hines talked about are, are as Jennifer said, sobering. Um, and uh, we know that um, the hardest hit industries in, in terms of unemployment are leisure and hospitality, wholesale and retail. Um, the manufacturing sector is is probably one of those that's that's uh, you know likely to be you know comparatively one of the, the stronger ones. Um, I think a lot of our manufacturers see some opportunities. Um, there may be some onshoring and some nearshoring. Um, and so you know, for our region, if if the goal is to keep this. Um, is to, is, is to do our best to shorten the span of, of whatever this uh, recession will look like. I think we wanna try to boost up any sectors that, that, that can. Um, and to the extent that we can help that manufacturing sector, that, that's, that's our, our, our goal. Um, I will say, um, I have known this, but to really see this, that engineers are problem solvers and watching them attack a problem is, is uh, it's it's really um, it's an interesting and it's great and you can see their juices are flowing. Um, I've worked with someone like Doug Crane for for a while now, but in, watching him now with an immediate problem, he is head down and trying to do anything he can to 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 crack this this, this problem, and, and that's really great. Um, so we are focusing on ways our companies and the region can be innovative and um, shift businesses and and shift practices. There's also just the um, how are they going to function? How most of our manufacturers have been deemed essential, um, and they're up and running, but they're really, you know, cautious and concerned about their employees and and, and making sure everyone stays safe and healthy and and, and can keep the production going. Um, I'll pick up lastly, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Is is that uh, what Jennifer said about focusing on the positive? I think we're really trying to to see what kind of opportunities um, this presents for, for the Berkshires and for this sector. Uh, there's no question this is going to be, this has been uh, uh, devastating locally and it will continue to be, but how can we work together to um, rebound? And, and I've, a, a, as Jennifer said, I have been so impressed by the energy and enthusiasm and just that problem solving um, attitude that we're, we're gonna bounce back and get this done. So uh, it's exciting to work with this group for me. Well, thanks, thanks again, Ben, for, for joining us. And it's, uh, it's definitely uh, it's quite a test to have a grand opening for a new organization um, and then face a pandemic crisis that you have to navigate through about three weeks later. So um, we're glad you're there. You're doing a good job. So we're going to shift to some questions. I, I want to start with the senator. And I, you know, Senator, those, those statistics, again, I just want to reiterate that, that they're done. You know, in this, in this region and, and in Massachusetts, you know, we compete with each other to bring in uh, opportunities with 25 new jobs, 50 new jobs, 100 new jobs, such small numbers when you talk about something as, as significant as a million plus people submitting unemployment claims uh, in a state of 7 million people. So the writing's on the wall. We need to get this economy moving. We have to do that in a responsible way. And a lot of those things have been happening. So on Monday, Governor Baker's expected to make a more formal announcement um, about the phases of reopening our economy. 
We know that Carlo Zaffanella from General Dynamics has been the Berkshire's voice in that advisory group. And I know that you've had a role as well, Senator. So could you talk a little bit, just maybe about that process more broadly, uh, the role that, that you and the delegation have had, and then also the, the access the Berkshire's have had to providing input to that dialogue? Sure, and maybe I'll start with what do we expect to see on Monday, because uh, I know that a lot of folks on the, on the call are, are interested in that. Um, if you've been watching the governor's press conferences, um, he's, he's kind of tipped his hand about the, both the process and what we expect on Monday. Um, in the first instance, it's, it's basically been centered around what are the health indicators we want to see. And so, you know, you've seen that whether it's the positive cases and the, um, or the hospitalizations, the capacity in the hospitals, the testing capabilities, um, that all paints a picture for when you can start to consider a reopening phase. Um, and then the phases, it, I, kind of saying that it, it's, it's a phase approach that's being considered. And really, there's been two dimensions to this in terms of economic impact and health risk. And you try to find those industries and sectors that have low risk but high economic impact. And you can imagine um, those that are in, the, in that category would be in the first phases. Um, so that's the second piece. The third piece has been what are the workplace protocols that need to be in place? So even though you're opening, it's, uh, the, the intention is that, that everyone will be following very strict protocols whether it's distancing, PPE, cleanliness, and the like. And so um, that is probably as important as testing because to get to the testing where we want to be, which is you know, universal, is, um, is we're talking about 100,000 tests a day in Massachusetts is the idea, the, the goal. Um, guess what? You can't get there. If you've, if you've been watching the national news, uh, the capacity in getting there from each, each piece of that testing process is incredibly difficult. And so you need to have alongside it these other protocols that will uh, be as effective in, in reducing the spread um, in addition to the testing and tracing. Um, so we'll be looking at that. I think the, the other, the key piece is that you have enablers um, or barriers to each industry. And so that's been a bulk of the, the advisory board's role is trying to drill into what that looks like. Um, is it transportation? Is it childcare? Is it supply chains? And so, um, as I mentioned, the, it's been 70 plus meetings that Carlo and Brenda Burdick have been a part of and me and my staff spreading out um, to, to really see what each sector needs and what those guidances might be. Um, you're right about the local participation. So having Carlo in there, um, he's been, he's been a, a strong advocate for the region. Um, and uh, I know you're not teeing it up for this reason, but now we have you on a, uh, an important subcommittee. Um, I was able to nominate Jonathan and one Berkshire to, to serve on the, I guess you can tell me what you're calling it, but anyway, tourism, restaurants, and accommodation is the intention to kind of do a, a closer look at what that, uh, those industries need because there has been a recognition and again I have to say Jonathan um, presented to the advisory board with Cape Cod in recognition that there is a difference in economies and so the economies that rely on tourism so heavily um, we need to be treated differently in terms of if there is an opening to safely uh, kind of be, be available during the summer season how can we achieve that and so that's the work that Jonathan will be doing now in the coming days to be clear on um, making sure we can be as prepared as possible for our, what could be a peak um, season. I, I'm saying all of this, of course, with the caveats around um, the health piece and the other um, responsible actions for, for safety being put in place. Um, and then there have been others around the region who have been on subcommittees, and I know the Tom Atusco, um Regional Planning Commission working on outdoor recreation and the others. So it's been, um, I, I do feel confident between that and the whole Berkshire delegation and the mayors um, constantly working together to advocate for the region um, and uh, and the health system and beyond. It's been a it's been a real team effort. Yeah, well, th thank you for that, Senator. Um, we, we were at one Berkshire just asked to participate in a small uh, subgroup of the, uh, the reopening advisory committee that will be focused on accommodations and restaurants. And and I literally was just on a call this morning pertaining to that and I'm waiting for further directions and some um, next steps that'll, that'll come forward this afternoon. So there'll be more to come on that, but it is important for the Berkshires uh, and, and we're excited to be able to work on that. And that's certainly gonna be one of the key areas as we, as we talk about you know, phase one and then to phase two. So talking about kind of the sectors, you know, as we, you know, there's gonna be a phase one, there's gonna be a phase two. I think two of the major sectors in the Berkshires and, and part of the reason why I wanted to have you on this call that there's been an argument for, can we get more activity going? You know, can we reopening manufacturing more generally? 
with phase one? Can we reopen some of our cultural properties, our historic properties, our museums uh, with phase one? You know, obviously with, with the proper considerations being taken. So I'd love to drill into that a little bit in terms of, you know, what is it gonna take in each of those sectors to safely reopen, to allow staff to remain with confidence, to get us back to um, you know, welcoming guests and to into building things in, in the Berkshires. So why don't we start with Ben? So th thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, from the manufacturing sector, um, you know, s some if not many uh, of the companies I've been working with and, and, and uh, the tech companies, uh, well, have been deemed essential. Some have been operating. Um, you know, they, one of the things that was said to me early on um, is that they, you know, assume everyone's positive and they're treating it that way. Um, I have been, uh, you know, heard from numerous people and, 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 and really a heartfelt message that our employees are so, they're not only family. I mean, that, that, that's the thing. They're family. We work alongside with them. We need them to be safe. Um, if they're going home to their family, we're going home to our family. We need to make sure they're safe. Um, and also, you know, the biggest concern or, or manufacturing cannot uh, operate a plant if, you know, if there's, an, if there's a positive test somewhere, um, you know, that, that's crippling. Um, so they're going above and beyond um, any way they can. And, I, and I, I've been impressed the way they're sharing best practices. Um, with each other. It's something we've tried to facilitate, but um, everything from, um, you know, every one of us at home deals with, with receiving uh, a box from Amazon or somewhere in, in that moment of what do you do with it? Uh, you know, my kids run out to grab a box. Well, think about uh, Lenco armored vehicles and they get, uh, you know, how many boxes a day. Um, so just little things about how they're handling that shipping and, and receiving and, and, and that process um, and how to protect their employees. And then, and, and and uh, and they've been really creative with it. They Lenco um, actually brought in an external shipping container, set it up outside, and has basically two shipping and receiving departments. So it goes to the external one first. Uh, the boxes will sit there for 24 hours. They get sprayed down, um, and then sent into their regular shipping um, uh, and receiving department. Um, and, and the spacing on the floors, you know, that's very really important. You know, these are open floors, and 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 just how to keep everyone spaced properly um, and keeping up with the demands for PPE like everything else uh, these are uh, you know essential workers so um, <laughs> got to provide them with masks and, and, and keep up with that demand um, because as more and more people come on and, and, and that just puts more pressure on um, on that supply chain um, so I think you know everyone is eager to um, you know continue to work, expand work, but also being totally cautious like, like, like we all are and, and knowing, uh, you know, playing the long game that, that the goal is to, to really protect people and, and, and work on those policies and procedures. And I think most have, have uh, leaned on each other, which has really been impressive to say, hey, what are you doing? How are you handling this? You know, um, because there, there are so many overlapping issues with people on a floor, changing shifts, um, how to do the timing and, and, and frankly, um, you know, talking to their talking to their teams and making sure any concerns, um, you know, are addressed and and you adjust for those concerns. So, um, I think those are some of the key points. Thank you for that, Ben. Jennifer, shifting to more the perspective of of your sector, um, you know. A lot of assumptions can be made around the types of things that that might be acceptable. Well, you know, with, with social distancing or considerations that have to be taken. And I know a lot of I've been on several different conversations with you. I know a lot of interesting uh, pre preparatory work has already been done, and there's some ideas. Can you talk about some of that and and how um the guidance that will come down? You're in many ways already prepared for. Yeah, I I first I would say that um, it's a heavy mantle to speak for the entire cultural sector uh, at this town hall, but. Um, I would say that we're all feeling stunned by the loss of our performing arts colleagues. And, you know, those were brave, tough decisions. Pam at Jacob's Pillow led that, I think. And uh, we're going to miss them. And we're trying to figure out ways to make the Berkshires, you know, a wonderful experience uh, with what we have. I think everybody's first concern is safety, but I think, and, and economic health, as Adam said, 
But beyond that too, we, we want to give people hope. I think that we all are feeling uh, beleaguered in however many weeks this has been now. And we're all just dying for something that, that gives us relief. Um, and the Berkshires are a place that, that really soothes the soul. Uh, to, to be a little cliche, but I think it's really true. It's a place that for, for centuries has inspired people. And it continues to inspire people um, physically and intellectually and emotionally. And um, we are looking at ways that uh, we might be an oasis for people. Um, I think that uh, this is a real opportunity for us to raise the profile of the Berkshires as an outdoor destination. Um, I'm, we're a, a number of the culturals are meeting about what our offerings might be uh, outdoors. You know, a lot of drive-ins, drive-bys. How can we, how can we reformulate what we've always done in a way that works in this new world and safely? Um, one example is our baby animals. Um, our baby animals festival draws about fourteen thousand people each year in mud season. Um, the pigs, fortunately, have not given birth yet. So, you know, depending on when we open, we may still be able to have baby animals. So we're building outdoor pens. So people don't even have to go inside to see them. And I think a lot of the culturals are, are trying to think of creative ways that they can, they can program, um, they can still program. And uh, I think we have the the benefit of a lot of wide open spaces. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Um, and everybody should, you know, as long as as long as the, the guidelines allow us, everybody should try to make a point to go see the baby pigs when they're born. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Jason, switching gears to the municipal side, what I think is a good, it's, it's, you know, we're talking about you know manufacturers potentially reopening some of our cultural institutions or larger properties potentially having a phase reopening and other types of businesses in the coming weeks. Um, having been a former municipal official my, I, myself, I'm, I'm sensitive to the, the, the challenges that, that you're going to have on the local level. So I know there's, there's been guidance that, well, there's been discussion at the state level that more specific guidance will come down from municipalities to help with code enforcement and clarity. But can you talk a little bit about that um, from the perspective of Williamstown and, and what other municipalities might be seeking, uh, even what you're thinking? Yeah, well, I think uh, we're all a little bit anxious at the moment, um, not only to support those that are open, but going back sort of where I opened, sitting, um, you, you know, usually whether we make our own rules at an annual meeting or um, the, the state has passed a past law, we have the time of reflection to understand what it means before we move into implementation. We, for the coming weeks, we're going to start getting things very quickly with a very compressed to non-existent kind of reflection time. Um, back up a step, um, you know, it's an unbelievable job that the, uh, you know, the reopening committee is doing to try to get a handle on the nuance of a bunch of different sectors in our, across our economy and across the Commonwealth. And also, what are all of the other laws and rules that may exist that are going to feed back into that, that are going to cause a little bit of a scramble, um, you know? And where we are in town government, uh, we want to be able to be supportive as quickly as possible because we have people who are ready to pivot to that reopening. And in, so in every one of these cases, I expect that, you know, we're going to have to be quickly reflective, which is going to be kind of the challenge in some cases, or we're going to have to help fill in some of the blanks as they come along. 
uh, you know, last week when uh, golf courses were suddenly opened. Uh, there was some pretty good guidance for our local golf courses had thought through some of it and I was having a conversation uh, with somebody who was operating one of them and her and she observed that one of the pieces was a little more stringent than she thought and immediately I realized, oh wait a minute, it sums up against something else. So that means, you know, conversation on our end with, um, you know, um, health official to say, okay, how are we going to actually handle this? Um, so I expect we're going to have more, more and more of those. Um, and also realizing in some cases that uh, we're all going to learn things where uh, people are going to need new materials, new supplies, jumpstart people. So I do worry about, I worry about opportunity on paper that we all struggle to put into practice. Thank you for that, Jason. We are having a little bit of trouble with Jason's audio. I apologize both to Jason and the listeners. We got, we got most of it, just a little bit. It's a little bit broken. So at, at this point, um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, and I'd like to encourage audience members, we have, we have some time, so please submit some more questions, uh, specific or broad, things that you're looking for some insight from our panel on. Um, but before we do that, any other, are there any other specific, um, do any of our panelists have any other specific points around reopening uh, the process right now or considerations that you'd like to speak to? Sure. Senator? Yeah, I mean, Jason um, brought up a few, I think, critical points, and, and so did Jennifer. So maybe <laughs> following up, I mean, I'm basically, you, you framed a, a question around the regional approach to reopening, and, and I do that as, in three different ways. And one, of course, is how are our medical uh, data, how is that, that indicating that we might be six weeks ahead of Boston? And so there's the question of do we start to progress through the phases at a, at a more rapid pace. And so that's, that's an interesting conversation that a lot of us have been having. And, and I personally think that there is value in doing that. Um, but then there's another question that, that was raised, which is how do we position ourselves in a new reality as a region that provides for more outdoor access, more spacing, um, remote working? There, uh, an interesting insight from companies that are reporting to the advisory board, the reopening advisory board, is that it was a rough estimate, 30 to 40% of the, uh, or, or the company thought they would keep 30 to 40% of their employees in a remote working posture, uh, certainly through the rest of the year, and they're considering even beyond because it's cost effective and the work is getting done. And so in that reality, with an acceleration in remote working, um, what does that mean for the Berkshires and how do we position ourselves? And, and so I think there's really an interesting discussion there. And then the third part is a little more what, what Jay, Jason said, is that I don't want to get ahead of the governor's announcement, but let's say that we're not going to be delayed by weeks by having a state certification that a company is, is meeting the criteria. So that means it's probably going to be a locally, uh, locally enforced, locally identified um, certification oh. process. And so it may not mean going door to door and business to business. It might be that, okay, the, the business has to certify that they're following these guidelines and then it's up to employees, um, which is an awkward situation. It's up to customers uh, to report to boards of health. And so it, it really quickly talks about the, the elevation and resources needed at the local level for the reopening process um, and a whole lot of big questions. And do we have a tool that can help answer that? Um, we had a chat uh, question, an online question around PPE. There's not a plan right now for the state to do a bulk order, bulk purchase of PPE. And instead, it'll take the form of an online list of vendors that are approved and vetting companies. And so that raises another question. Do we as a Berkshires do a bulk purchase um, that is made available for purchase by local companies and individuals? Um, and so you keep going down. There's a there's a real need for a regional approach to a reopening. Um, the last one I want to flag is the biggest impacted uh, population in terms of employees has been people making less than $40,000 a year because they're typically in restaurants, in the hotel industry, and, and on and on. 
the service industry. And so what are we doing to do about this, this large portion of our population? And, and so some original ideas that I've heard include a, uh, you know, websites, and I know um, the Berkshires has one for jobs over 40, or one Berkshire does. Um, it makes the case that maybe we have one for under as well that says, okay, you might shift from that waiting tables that you used to be doing, and now we're doing curbside pickup. So what, is there another job that could be available in that space as other companies are in fact ramping up? And so, um, again, that's a regional approach there makes a lot of sense. And so um, I just wanted to raise that flag. I just want to pick up, if I can, Jonathan, on, on something at, at, you know, at Adam talked about and Jennifer talked about both the, the opportunity here um, and recognizing what that might be and how we can position ourselves to take advantage of it. Um, that number, I haven't heard that specific number, 30 to 40 percent remaining um, remote, but it's not shocking at all. Um, companies I speak to who said, prior to this, I would have never considered allowing anyone to work remote. It's just not what we do. This is what we do, and we're not a remote company, are now saying, hey, there is a real both, A, it's a reality, so let's adapt to it, but there's a real lot of benefits to it as well. And if, um, you know, for some of our companies, attracting talent has been an issue um, or attracting uh, or uh, um, finding a uh, position for the, I hate the phrase, but the trailing spouse. Um, I think there's an opportunity for the Berkshires to position itself. I was speaking, um, as we all have, I'm sure, to uh, uh, you know friends around the country, but I was speaking to a former colleague in Manhattan the other day who told me he had not left his apartment in a month. He had not left the door in, his month, uh, in a month. Um, he had some health concerns uh, aside from this, um, so he felt he was very vulnerable. Um, but you know, we're really fortunate uh, where we live, and I think to the extent that um, we can capitalize on that opportunity and reach out to people who uh, are, um, you know, not all that different than after 9-11. I think after 9-11, there, 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 there was a group of people who moved up to the Berkshires saying, you know, I, I just want to get out of that uh, high density urban atmosphere. I'm not, I'm not comfortable there right now. Um, and if you're able to work remotely and we're able to facilitate that and companies are, are, are able to facilitate that, that, that may be an opportunity for people um, to to for the Berkshires to grow in that sense um, and I think uh, you know any opportunity we can we can do to be to be really supportive of, of, of people who are interested in making that transition into companies who, who are who are welcoming those type of employees um, I, I think I think that would be a, a wise move up for us I would, I would just add to that I think that I've been so impressed by how nimble and creatively thinking people are in the Berkshires in general. And I'm really seeing it uh, accelerated. It, it, it's, I'm, I'm always looking for that silver lining, but I think it's really true. It's inspiring, you know, from the city of Pittsfield uh, giving out 2000 Chromebooks when they realized that they had a real problem that many kids could not afford uh, computers to Roots Rising doing their their virtual farmers market. I think that uh, I think that we're nimble by nature, and as as Ben said, you know, as more people um, choose to work remotely or given that opportunity to work remotely, that there is a um, there's an opportunity for us to retool ourselves, and it's not going to be easy. And as we know, it's very painful right now. But I do think I'd rather be living here than anywhere else. I think that's a good. Um, I think that's a good aspiring thought for all of us. <laughs> I, I definitely agree that uh, I'd rather be living here than anywhere else. To that point, with both of you too, I, I, you know, speaking to the positives, what are the opportunities here? That that certainly is one that there's been a lot of discussion about, especially when we talk about how the entire American, even global workforce, has shifted to. Um, you know, digital and Zoom and interface and communication through this type of a channel, you know, when we come out of this, we're really going to have probably undergone a five or 10 year sort of evolutionary leap with technology. And as we talk about things like broadband, which I'm going to come back to, um, we, we, uh, we have an opportunity there to potentially really capitalize the region. Um, people can have the opportunity to keep their jobs in Boston or New York, but post pandemic and in the coming years, they could potentially escape and live in a place like the Berkshires. And I think we've been positioning ourselves in a lot of other ways for that. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to actually jump to a slightly different topic for a moment. Uh, look to Jason first. There was a question about code enforcement and um, with businesses reopening. And we, we, we've already seen, there's been some local examples of, of businesses um, not being on the same page as municipalities about whether or not they fit certain definitions. That's probably going to become a little clumsier as we do a phase one and a phase two, and there's more businesses allowed to open and there's more areas of gray. Can you talk, Jason, maybe a little bit about the municipal mindset on that? Uh, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's with a little bit of anxiety that, uh, that we see that in that, you know, understanding that we're going to, in all likelihood, receive a frame, and then we have to work within, within that, within that frame, and we're going to have to make some decisions. I mean, I know, uh, I know over the course so far, it's been a challenge, um, you know, in, in uh, Pittsfield and North Adams, visibly at some points and i think that that's um you know uh while we haven't dealt with that yet locally it's certainly something that is um a cause for concern um because you know we're tensions are you know running high on all of these pieces right now so i think you know I, our view is that our intention is to be uh, as creative as supportive and engaging as possible uh but you know, I think that that's offset by sort of hoping that there's sort of an understanding and appreciation that our our ability to do that is going to be within a given frame. Um, yeah, and and you know, I mean, we deal with this in a lot of ways already, um, but it's sort of less less intense. You know, if you operate a restaurant, you operate a lodging establishment, there are, there are inspections and requirements you have to meet regularly. Uh, this is just a set of new things all at once. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll work our way through that. I think none of us uh, want to be in a position, uh, particularly now and particularly what we've been through, in um, having to be in, in an aggressive enforcement stage. Um, you know, with, uh, with any of our businesses, any of our residents or any of our visitors. You know, uh, just, just even right now, um, you know, uh, Trust me, if, if you've been spotted in Williamstown not wearing a mask in public, I or one of my staff have probably been notified about it. Um, because I think that's the other piece that we wrestle with is that for um, you know, all of our interest in sort of re-engaging people, um, you know, we have an equal perhaps constituency that uh, is, very concerned about where we are in this whole trajectory of this of this illness and um you know sitting in local government we're kind of the vehicle for both of those um both of those sort of sets of people to express their um excitement and anger all at the same time and our job is to try to navigate through successfully all of those Thank you for that, Jason. And your, your audio visual is back and strong. So we're in good shape again, <laughs> hearing you. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump back, uh, maybe start with the Senator. If anybody else wants to chime in on the topic as well, it's fine. But there was a question about broadband. I'm going to go there, Senator. I know it's a topic you hear about all the time, but just, just considering the opportunity that we have, um, not just long term uh, with capitalizing on broadband now because of the other economic doors that might open and how this situation in many ways has, has exaggerated that opportunity. Um, but even even reacting to the moment as we go through phase one, phase two, phase three, and significant portions of our workforce are going to continue to be required to stay home and work remotely. Uh, and I would add to that education, uh, remote learning and, and access. Yeah. And um, we've gotten a fair amount of attention, attention, including in a hearing. We had three people from the region testifying in front of the education committee on, um, I don't know what day that was. It's all, it's COVID time sometime earlier this week and um i think it was wednesday essentially making this case that you you can't expect the teachers and the students to be sitting in a car in, in a parking lot where there's wi-fi access and so um we've been trying to drill into how we can accelerate the the uh, connectivity in our towns and um an improvement where there is i mean even jason is in downtown williamstown and uh, having this experience next to a world-class university or college and so um there's a there's a pretty big issue at stake here um, we've tried to 
accelerate federal funds. Um, I won't get too far into the weeds, but there's $10 million coming in that uh, is contingent on, on a whole group of municipal owned towns getting online and getting up to speed. And we're trying to say, can't you front load that and accelerate? There's, a, there's an inherent um, challenge in we're moving past the make ready and into the, the construction phase. And so it's actually just tangible movement of wires by utilities that's taking place. And, um, and there's been a challenge because of health concerns to, to have them accelerate. So I know this is getting wonky, but the, the strategy today to accelerate has been you cluster the utilities to move down the line of poles. And they're saying, well, wait a second, with COVID, we don't want to cluster. Um, and so there, there are just very practical challenges to the lighting up. Um, but I will say that this has been a priority in the last uh, couple of months to say, given the writing that's on the wall for, for workers, for learners, uh, for the future of the Berkshires, we have to really double down on this right now. And so uh, between that and um, access to federal funds that could be coming, we're, we're trying our best. Great, thank you for that. I know broadband is always a hot topic for us in the Berkshires, um, but I also think it's important to note that a lot of tremendous work has been done with that in the last in the last decade. But um, you know, continuing to have demand and, and an opportunity with that, it's uh, it certainly not, it continues to be a pertinent question. Another topic that was kind of alluded to in the Q and A that I think is important to touch on is the idea of uh, of contact tracing and our our plan and capacity in the region for contact tracing. Maybe again, Jason, you could jump into this. I, I, I believe local boards of health have the initial responsibilities with contact tracing, but there's also some reinforcement from the local health system and the state. Yeah, uh, the, the, um, the, the local uh, boards of health uh, receive notification uh, when there um, is a suspected positive case. Um, and and I think one of the great things we have now is the, uh, the system that the Commonwealth has put in place for Commonwealth tracing that we can really sort of plug, plug people into that system to be able to dig deeper a lot faster. Uh, and um, that's reassuring to have that um, to, to have to have that capability. Um, I think the, the challenge is going to be um, as we move from a period where you know, we've done a great job within the Berkshires over the past couple months in uh, managing numbers and everything that we've done has really kept that number down. As the border becomes more porous and we become more open and we start welcoming people from further and further afield, the, I, I think, you know, contact tracing is going to be a challenge. Um, I do think though that that's where the, the state resources are going to be tremendous. The other, um, quite another question we had prompted that I thought was somewhat interesting is this idea around, and, and you know, Jennifer, you got into this a little bit in, in some of your earlier responses, and um, we had a little bit of discussion also before the, the panel formally started when we were getting set up. But the idea around some, um, as we think about reopening some novel approaches, you know, what are, what are some of the novel approaches we might see uh, from the cultural institutions, from some of our larger properties that can reimagine their space? I know a lot of that thinking has already happened. And even um, you know on the municipal side, or you know, can we can we do things like close Spring Street to restaurants? Can we do things like close parts of North Street in Pittsfield or uh, downtown uh, streets in Great Barrington? So I'd, I'd love to hear some thoughts on some of these outside the box novel approaches that we know uh, that the state is actually having an open mind about. Um, I would say uh, a few of them, which I'm in discussions with, is. Uh, cultural organizations that are traditionally thought of as buildings with interior spaces are contemplating whether they're going to open their interior spaces this year. You know, trustees of the reservation, NOMCAG, for example, uh, has announced that next Tuesday, I believe, they're opening their grounds. So thinking, looking at our spaces, you know, we have 750 acres, trails, a pond, 20 buildings, looking at our spaces with a, a, a new perspective. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, car programming, drive-ins, drive-throughs. You know, Berkshire Botanical Garden has, is doing, I think, outdoor films. Biff announced that they wanna do different outdoor locations. Um, that's another way that people are trying to creatively problem solve. And then, you know, on a very specific example, um, 
I'm talking to Brian Allberg, who is the chef at Seeds, about do we think about a time ticketing package that also includes a picnic? So you can go off by yourself and have lunch and you can still have that experience of enjoying uh, food and creativity in the Berkshires, but you're doing it more in isolation. And I actually think that that's, um, I, I keep harping back to these silver linings, but you know, the food culture in the Berkshires is very special. And I think those of us who live here know that, but I don't think it's that well known. And I think that this may be an opportunity for all of us to think about how people gather creatively around programming and food. I think, that, I think that's, a, that's a, a great characterization of, of, of where creativity can really be looked at differently as we go through these next few weeks and in, in the coming months. Does anybody else want to chime in on that idea of some novel approaches? Uh, I, I think we're definitely uh, open. Um, you know, we've been having some conversations, um, you know, with, um, my staff, uh, with our local chamber, with some of our local businesses, just trying to figure out, hey, where are those, where are those other opportunities? You know, the early stages of it, we were a little opportunistic. Um, you know, uh, we, we repaved Spring Street because it was coming up, um, which was something that I thought, you know, I never thought I'd be in a situation where, you know, we would receive compliments instead of concerns about adding more construction in the business district. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I think we, we tried to set the stage on that, but, you know, we, we've talked about, okay, if, how do we close downtown for, um, to facilitate um, more seating for restaurants? And then, you know, which then leads to a, hmm, anybody have tables for that? Uh, and, and so all of these were kind of, you know, poking all of these different things to try to think through what they all look like. We're looking at some of our spaces differently and saying, could we, could we do an event there in a place we've never thought is an event space? I think that's where a lot of this creativity is going to be helpful. And then also we're kind of being sensitive to some of our other locations and figuring out how do we help them. It's great that you can go uh wander the grounds of some of our other uh cultural facilities in town uh but that's that it creates engagement but it doesn't really monetize that and we're sensitive to that as well and thinking about okay how do we help people bridge that um i'm hoping that not only through this first wave of of responding but but ongoing that we learn some new things that make this better for our residents and, and visitors some of the things that we've taken as givens in all of this time maybe maybe we'll look at a fresh perspective mm -hmm. i just note real quickly jonathan that um we're we're talking about reopening and there's a distinction on on may 19th let's refocus on reinvesting and uh and and kind of the recovery piece because there's a lot of damage that's been done um I, I do like in the category of of unique approaches it strikes me that if we're to the extent we're trying to position ourselves as a as a center for outdoor recreation we should really stay focused as well on on you know what does that infrastructure look like do we have can we shift funds state funds or otherwise into developing our trails so that we have that um that that, that access to market to people and make it more attractive to be here um i saw mayor bernard was on earlier but um he he's he's an example we've been working to shift state funds from one pot of money related to trails that's not being spent into another one so that this summer we'll have um jobs um, and shovels in the dirt and a, in a in a nature that's distant you know in a in a space that's distance and it'll create a long-term return uh, for the economy so those are the things we're keeping our eye out for for sure uh there was a there was a question posed from somebody that had, that had presented the thought of um you know in the recent news with with cranes transition that um you know when looking to our future uh someone had shared that manufacturing isn't the answer and 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 ben had ben had made a note that he wanted to speak to that and as i think of manufacturing still being about seven percent of workforce in the berkshires i believe it's uh, uh formidably the, the highest average wage level of any of the sectors and and certainly we just had the berkshire innovation center open three months ago so you want to respond to that thought ben yeah yeah thank you jonathan and thanks malcolm for the question i, I think um First of all, across the board with COVID, what you're what we're seeing is um, that it's accelerating many things that were already starting to take place um, that were already percolating, even remote learning, um, 
for our students, uh, remote workforce, um, maybe trends to, to get to the Berkshires. I think there's a lot of things that it's accelerated. And, and I think there's an opportunity for to really, it, it's going to accelerate some of the trends in manufacturing. So I think when we say manufacturing, uh, there's still a perception out there that it's some of these, you know, first or second generation or, or, or industry uh, standards um, of a more of a mass production assembly line view of people uh, think about. And I think where that's going is more towards, you know, industry 4.0 with, you know, smart manufacturing, the smart factory, um, you know, sort of utilizing the internet of things to, to, to change the way we do manufacturing so we can compete with China. And, and, and really, you know, we don't win on quantity here in the Berkshires, we win on quality and, and, and being at the forefront and, and sort of the most innovative. So, um, you know, I do think that there's an opportunity for this sector um, you know, to, to, to accelerate that process. And we see it a lot. And, and that's something that the, 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 the BIC, the Virtual Innovation Center was brought online to do, right? It's, it was brought online to help, you know, sort of some of these legacy existing companies grow. Where are they going to be in? We always said prior to COVID, I always said, you know, where are these companies going to be in five or 10 years? And, and, and maybe what COVID's done is, is, is shrunk that five or 10 years and say, how are these companies going to get to where they want it to be? But let's do it quicker. Um, and, and those are, like, like Jonathan alluded to, higher paying, better jobs. So let's, um, let's try and get there quicker. Um, so I think there is a real opportunity there. Thanks for that, Ben. And I, and I think that's so important to think about as we talk about our future and, and post-COVID life and, and balance in our economy and the importance of all, each of our sectors. So I, we're, we're past 11 o'clock, we start tonight. I do like to sort of finish on a, on a positive note with each of our panelists for these town halls. And I think today, you know, our topic is reopening the economy. You know, we're not, we're not focused on staying under the curve. We're not focused on reaction to the pandemic. Um, you know, those things are all still major considerations. Uh, health and wellness comes first. However, this is this has shifted to a more optimistic conversation about some businesses reopening, some activities resuming, um, some steps forward out of what's been a very dark couple of months here in, in, the, in the Berkshires and in, in America. So I'd love to have you all just take a, a, a moment and just, just share, uh, you know, a closing thought, uh, maybe something inspirational to your sector and your audience, um, or just uh, you know, a little bit about um, your optimism as we look forward in the coming months ahead of us. And why don't we start with Jennifer? Uh, well, I would say that, you know, the, the Shakers settled here before slavery was abolished in Massachusetts, before the Treaty of Paris was signed. They were here for 200, well, 180 years. And uh, I find so much inspiration in in just their daily life. And I would say that last year, I asked our, our main farmer, um, we have these split, basically uh, split rail fences and we have five acres of vegetables. And I asked, you know, does anybody ever hop the fence and, you know, take the tomatoes? And he said, you know, during hard times when neighbors would steal from the Shakers Gardens, their response was, next year we need to plant another row. And I think that we are all just beginning our journey to plant another row in the Berkshires. Thank you for that, Jennifer. We'll jump to, to Ben. Yeah, thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, I would say, uh, uh, you know, one thing I talked a lot about before our opening, uh, before we opened the center, which, which is a beautiful brand new building, was that the importance of and, and the longevity and, and the impact we make at the Berkshire Innovation Center it, it is not and cannot be about, uh, you know, the building itself. Um, we, we have to be more than the building. And, and it, what's most important is, is, is the people and, and that are involved and the networks involved in the, in the collaboration, the information they are sharing. Um, so that's been tested right away because we sort of we open and then we close. And, and what we tried to do, do is, um, you know, is, is test that theory. And I think I, I've been inspired by, uh, by the way that the, the so-called network has been collecting and collaborating and, and um, 
you know, sharing information to try to move projects forward, whether it is a PPE project or uh, something to keep their, their team safe or something brainstorming about the future uh, uh, of sort of manufacturing and innovation and technology in the Berkshires. So, um, you know, we didn't build an innovation center uh, you know, in an island without history. This is a this is a, an area rich in in the innovative people from William Stanley, uh, you know, all all, all the way to uh, James Kupernick now. So how are we, uh, you know, how are those current people building on that legacy? It's really inspiring to watch them, and I think it's been great for us. And I think it's uh, gives me, uh, you know, sort of that we all need a little inspiration every day when we wake up and deal with the current crisis and look out and say, oh, what's our day look like? And I've been inspired by the people I've been working with. So um, very impressed by them. Thank you, Ben. Jason? Um, I think we've all, we, we've all had a chance uh, during this to, uh, we've been forced to be creative. We've um, thought about new ways to do things. Um, we've, um, and over the next couple of weeks, we will continue to aggressively all be thinking about that. And I think that really is a great opportunity to sort of challenge some of the assumptions we used to carry with us um, to look at things with a new perspective. And even in our own lives, you know, uh, there are things that we've realized that we miss because they haven't been available to us and things that we value all about being here. I think that gives us an amazing foundation to look at where we are with that, with a fresh set of eyes and figure out where we're going next. I think we're also very lucky here because in addition to all of us that are here, we have this wonderful extended family of people who have had the Berkshires be part of their lives and whether it's one vacation, multiple vacations, summer camp, uh, visiting our culturals every year. Uh, and we're going to be offering them a lot of what they're a lot we're realizing they're missing and they want and so the combination of us having these things that are desired plus our own refocus on where we're going next i think positions us well for the future thank you jason and the last word from the senator all right thanks again jonathan and, and thanks to everyone for 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 joining the conversation today uh, I have to say that if in February we were spending a lot of time trying to address some concerning trends in the region related to population decline or where the economy was headed globally and what that, how we were positioned, um, honestly, we could come out of this in a much better position if we've seen an acceleration towards remote working, towards telemedicine and, and the like, and a de-urbanization that people are articulating right now. Um, we, we might be stronger after this. And so I think that that speaks to the need to get those fundamentals right. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting turn of events that, that, is, um, that the pandemic has posed. And, and we as a region are as well placed as any other to, um, to come out stronger. Well, that, that, that brings us to a conclusion today. Um, the, the first thing I want to do is I do want to thank all of our listeners. I think we, we topped out at about 140 participants at one point. So that's great. Um, we appreciate all of you taking the time to tune in. Uh, we're, I'm going to lose all of you when, when the webinar closes, when I'm done with these remarks. So I want to thank all of our, our panelists. This is a, a, another fantastic panel. Um, if each of you taking the time out of your busy days with a lot on your plate right now, it, it means a lot to us and, and certainly the listeners. And just thank you all for your continued leadership, your, your creativity, and your thoughtfulness through this entire process. Um, a quick shout out to my, my team at One Berkshire and, and Ben Lamb, who's on the back end of this, helping with the Q&A and, and some of the logistics. I always appreciate their help. They, they, make, they make it easy for me. I just have to log on and moderate a conversation and try not to get in your way. Uh, and then I'd also just say, please join us again next week, next Friday at 10 a.m. We're actually going to have the, the, the presidents from Williams College, Mass College of Liberal Arts, and Berkshire Community College. They're going to talk about the state of higher ed in the Berkshires and what they're seeing nationally. And this particular uh, webinar is also gonna be available for rewatching on Pittsfield Community Television throughout the course of the week. And you can always log on to oneberkshire.com and watch our entire log of all of these virtual town halls. So with that, um, I wanna wish you all well. I hope you all stay healthy and that all of you have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you.